Hey there, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week on the 302, a very special Christmas edition as Rockwood is transformed into a child's Christmas dream. The theme of this year's exhibit is Visions of Sugar Plums, and it certainly does not disappoint. Get ready for a very merry 302 headed your way. It is a very Merry Christmas here at Rockwood, and we're joined now to talk a little bit about what's going on for the holidays with Ryan Grover. Ryan, Merry Christmas Merry to you. Merry Christmas to you. So let's talk a little bit about this year's theme. This place is decked out and looking great. You know, I like to uh, brag every year about our accomplishments, but our major accomplishment this year is that we actually ran out of lights. We used them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So this, this year's theme is Visions of Sugar Plums. Mm -hmm. Talk Talk to me a little bit about how you settled on this theme. Sure. So um, some descendants of the house, individuals who um, uh, came from individuals that had been born or raised in this house. Um, uh, befriended us in the last couple of years and they gifted back to the house a bed, this crib that had once been in the house. We believe that it was used for one of the Bringhurst kids uh, sometime after the 1892 period when they moved back into this house. And so the bed was here. Um, eventually there weren't any children here and people moved on and they got married and the bed moved out of the house and it just recently came back for the first time in probably about a hundred years. And so we were so thrilled to have this bed come back that we wanted to be able to kind of center it in some place some way and we tried to think of natural ways that we could you know put a crib in a big living room or a ballroom or a kitchen or someplace that would make sense and um, and so we centered on this idea that the bed would represent a dreaming child and we created decorations that were the fantasies of this child all throughout the house now you guys are so lucky that you have so many original artifacts to the Bringhurst and Shipley families, mm. you know, and when you look at this, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's all hand carved. You, we happen to know like where it might have been made or just that it was owned by them? At this point, the, the, the bed itself was probably made sometime after the Civil War. And at that point, you could order uh, furniture in America by a catalog pretty easily. There were rail systems. So this bed could have been made in any of the major cities nearby, more than likely Philadelphia, perhaps New York. And more than likely, they sort of bought this as part of a suite of furniture. But right. this is the crib is what it sort of exists. And this situation is something that you have had the pleasure of, of being in uh, many times because you've had furniture a lot of furniture and artifacts over the years come back to you, is that right? Most certainly. Um, there have been really supportive family members of the house since it became a museum in 1976. But I feel like since I've started here in the last couple of years as its director, we've had a lot of involvement with the family. And you know, I, I have to say, like one particular individual sent an entire truckload of materials that used to be a part of this house. So um, we've been we've been very blessed lately. So they're really committed to their family legacy being um, Preserved. And for the success of this institution, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it really is beautiful when you walk into this room, not only the beautifully carved bed, but you have these three trees and you have a group of folks that have been hard at work, like running out of lights. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So um, I, the first props that I have to give, of course, are to Rockwood's horticulturalists, um, the team of individuals that deal with the garden space. They um, set up the lighting system that that is all throughout the entire park. Um, they're working on this in September. So wow. um, it's really, really amazing the work that they've done. And this year, like I said, it's um, it's extra special because <laughs> it took everything that we have. Literally, the stores, the the, the shelves are completely empty. Um, and then, in addition to that. Um, uh, the Rockwood Park Preservation Society. So this is our nonprofit friends group here at mm -hmm. Rockwood. Um, they were the ones who organized, principally their director or their president, Devin Francis, was the individual who designed up the Christmas decorations and the Christmas scheme here within the museum. And how many Christmas trees do you have up, you think? This is a, this is actually a light year. We only have about 20. <laughs> only about 20. <laughs> I mean, I myself only have, you know, 10. No, just kidding. Um, so when you talk about doing something of this magnitude, 
there's so much to see. So when someone's going to come for a visit, mm -hmm. what is it that, um, how should they start? I mean, there's a lot going on outside, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so. absolutely. So there's a couple of ways to be able to sort of engage with uh, Rockwood right now. Um, so uh, all of our tours through the month of December. So if you come for a house tour, any of the times that we're open Thursday through Sunday, um, you will be able to engage with the house and you'll be able to come for free. This is, uh, this is uh, as part of Newcastle County government, uh, Rockwood um, does this sort of give back to the to the to the community, um, making most of its programs free the month of December. So those tours are free through the end of the year, mm -hmm. and then also the park. You um, can come for the museum during the daytime hours, but in the evening, starting around four o'clock, five o'clock, the timers of all the lights in the park go off, and those are up until about ten o'clock at night. I can imagine it's probably really beautiful out there, and occasionally mobbed. Yes, a occasionally <laughs> mobbed. So when you come, you want to you want to take your time and d not have an agenda or a place to be. Just kind of you know, enjoy it. Absolutely. And, you know, just bring a hot drink, be able to walk through the paths. We have we've had really beautiful um, weather lately, so it's been really, really terrific. Mm -hmm. Now, there's like several um, rooms in the house that you guys have decorated, so mm -hmm. the whole place is uh, all decked out, right? Especially the first floor, but the second floor is also open for a lot of tours. Really? Yeah. So, and the second floor is my favorite. When you go in that beautiful, up that beautiful staircase. It's true. It's it true. really is gorgeous. Do you have a favorite room? Uh, I think this is actually my favorite room this year. I really love the color arrangements with it. And of course, I love anything that sort of features the permanent collection. Yeah, absolutely. And it just must be such a pleasure to be able to say, okay, we've got this thing and let's just put it out there, you know, because there's so much. Yeah, it really allows us to be very creative with absolutely. the ways that we're reinterpreting these materials for new audiences. Now, if you think this is gorgeous, just wait until you see the dining room. We're going to check that out when we return. I'm Reggie Lynch, Director of Interpretation and Engagement at Winnetor Museum, Garden, and Library, and I really love nature on the 302. Welcome back. We have moved into the dining room, and Ryan, I gotta tell you, every holiday that we visit you guys, this is the place to be. It is so gorgeous. I know like in our regular homes, you know, Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, that's when we bring out the, the fine china, but you guys have really outdone yourself. That whole um, vision of sugar plum theme that we're leaning into right now, um, we really let it, we really let the dining room table be a, a, a complete stage for that. And so this is all about kids' fantasies, about the holidays. And so it's every dessert that we have in our arsenal, all of these fun things, all of these, we went out and bought more, but um, it's really just kind of a, uh, a landscape of sugar and temptations and just really, really fun. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit about this place setting. I don't think in the five years we've been coming to you guys that I've seen it. Interesting that you should point it out because we just received this place setting back in the last year. Um, again, this is another object that was returned to us by one of the descendants of Rockwood. Um, so this ser service we think was owned by Joseph Shipley when he bought or built the house in uh, 1851. He would have brought this service from England and it was produced by Josiah Wedgwood in England in probably about 1830. To 1840. It really goes nicely with the theme because it's got grapes and leaves and just it's really really gorgeous. Is that like a gold like a gold leaf on there? It or? is so it's sort of um, hand painted gold decoration that they apply outside of the glaze of the ceramic. It really just makes things pop and really sort of accentuates those colors. Because back in the day I mean they didn't have mass production where it was a stamp. I mean somebody actually had to paint this on there. Oh teams of individuals and this was one of the upcharges that you could do in ceramics. Yeah. Um, uh, when you were ordering a service you could have sort of a simple service, you could have extra decoration or you could have even gold applied decoration on top of it. That's so beautiful. Now, is this the, the layout the way it would have been on Christmas, uh, Christmas Eve or Christmas morning? Would well, they Interestingly, so our family here were Quakers, and we don't really have a huge indication that they celebrated Christmas in really as any significant way. Yeah. But we have such a beautiful interior, and so many of our family members now do celebrate Christmas. We really needed to sort of lean into it. Sure. So this is very much a fantasy for this house, but it mm -hmm. is kind of, um, especially with decorating with treats and sort of small uh, um, uh, desserts and small sort of uh, things to tempt children and families and members and such, um, that's definitely something that you would have 
seen in the 1800s, early 1900s with Christmas decorating inside the house. Well, there certainly are a lot of shiny things in here. You know, you've got the candlesticks on the mantle. I mean, are those also um, relics of the family? Or? Oh yeah, in this room especially, almost everything that you see are things that came yeah. from the house or, or had been added to the house by different members of the family over about a 120 year period of time. So when they did have a family celebration, when everyone came together, you know, there were four children in mm -hmm. the Bringhurst family. Would they have been sitting here or is there another area? Would there have been another area for them? Um, so a lot of our rooms are sort of multi-purpose rooms. So there might have been kind of different kinds of celebrations here. You can definitely walk in and sort of think about the sort of grand tablescape and just having the very sort of traditional sort of dining room um, situation. But you could also break these tables up, create smaller um, uh, sort of smaller individual table settings and have more of a um, uh, sort of like lunch parties and things of that nature as well. So these rooms really lended themselves to a lot of different kinds of entertaining. And the Bringhurst especially, the ones that lived here from about 1892 to 1965, they entertained all the time. I would entertain all the time, <laughs> most definitely. Now, as we were coming here from the living room, I noticed a small side room where you have the most adorable tea party with teddy bear set Absolutely, up. Absolutely, yeah. Talk to me a little bit about just what went into putting that all together. Together. Um, again, it was the, the the love affair of all like of this um, kids' fantasy for the holidays, mm -hmm. and um, and we had wonderful donors that brought in uh, all of the teddy bears that you see here. So most of those were donations from the community, and we were able to just kind of create this whole little setting. Um, yeah. The china that's in that room was also a recent addition from one of the oh, descendants nice. of the family, and we think that it would have been um, a service that would have commemorated the uh, marriage of Queen Victoria to Prince Albert. That is such an artifact to have. You must have been so thrilled when you unbox it. Oh, and especially with these bright colors. I mean, they're just, um, not only are they thematically interesting and really sort of tied to the history of the house and to the people that lived here, but they look great. Yeah, they absolutely <laughs> do. And across the hall, there's like a whole table of bohemian glass mm -hmm. that really is an eye catcher. Absolutely. Um, we often have little bits of that sort of scattered throughout the house during the year, but during this period, because we really just wanted to sort of turn up the volume on everything, um, we brought out most of our collection. And most of that was provided by one of the Bringhurst daughters as she um, retired back to this house in the 1920s. Yeah, when you go into the study, it seems like the perfect place to write a letter to Santa, which if they were Quakers, they wouldn't have done, but it's set up just so beautifully. It really is, it really is. We're just, we're very fortunate with the things that we have here and the stories that we're able to tell with these objects. Can you talk a little bit about just the vibe that you guys have when you're putting this, you know, exhibit together? It must just, you know, fill everybody up with the spirit. It is, but it's also, um, it's also a real race. So um, if, um, uh, we also, so we lean very heavily into Christmas, but we also lean very heavily into Halloween because, of course, we have this um, we have this reputation for being haunted. And yeah. We do programming around these sort of ghost stories and um, and and uh, and thinking about sort of the romantic period that created the decorations for this house, the de the design of this house, but at the same time also created that whole period of horror genre mm -hmm. for like literature. So it all sort of comes from the same place, and so we love that time period, but it's all month of October and then starting on November 1, we're getting right into Christmas. So we have about a month turnaround time between the holidays. Now, I, we talked about this off camera about the show, The Gilded Age, yes. and this is sort of in that, is that in the realm, in the, in the time frame uh, of Absolute that? overlap. So our house here is built around 1851. So the house itself predates the Gilded Age period. Um, uh, but the Beaux-Arts decorations of that form of architecture that you're seeing in Newport and mm -hmm. the mansions in New York, um, more towards the turn of the century, were definitely adopted for the decoration here in the house. So you mm -hmm. see layers of that Gilded Age placed over top of the Gothic Revival sort of core of the house. So it must be kind of interesting for you to kind of like watch that and be like, oh, you know. And, and, and especially, um, you know, this year, uh, especially they do such a fantastic job with the costuming in the Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have a lot of, of dresses that were created by the designers that they're talking about in the Gilded Age in our collection here. So it's just the, the parallels are really, really eerie and wonderful. Do I hear another 302 show on costumes? <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> oh, we love coming here. So we're going to go into another room when we return.
I'm Debbie Buxton from the Historic Odessa Foundation. Literature comes to life on the 302. Welcome back. We are in the kitchen where all the magic happens, of course, on Christmas. Ryan, you guys really outdid yourself here because you really get the vibe that, you know, the meal is being prepared here. For sure, for sure. Um, again, uh, we're really, really fortunate to have all of these wonderful things that were left over by different family members of the year. And we have an incredible assortment of objects that have been accumulated here for the for the, for the the kitchen. So we're able to do sort of like um, mini cooking demonstrations, baking and different kinds of, um, I don't know, sort of food preparation yeah. techniques that would have happened, and especially in the first part of the 20th century. So um, I noticed that there is a recipe container. Do you have some of the recipes that the family would prepare? So we do have a recipe box. We're not quite sure if they represent things that were used by the family or if they were things that were donated by one of our volunteers okay. in later years. But we do have some, and the recipes that we have do date from the 1930s to the 1950s. And this is really interesting. I know that um, there was, uh, the family was connected to uh, an early pharmacy, mm -hmm. is that right? So they would have things like this all over the place. And there's also a garden where they would grow some of these herbs? So um, we, so uh, the Bringhurst opened, a, um, the Bringhurst family opened up an apothecary, yeah. um, sort of a pre-pharmacy yeah. term for, an apo uh, for a pharmacy. Um, uh, I think in the 1780s down on Market Street in downtown Wilmington. And that pharmacy um, operated there until the 1920s, which mm -hmm. is really sort of amazing. But um, the family were definitely involved with pharmaceutical development. They were creating their own um, medications, their own drugs there. Um, they had their own bottling company and you can find yeah. Bringhurst bottles and things of that nature. Um, whether or not they might have had an apothecary garden here, we don't have any record of that, but we have created an apothecary garden at the west end of the house here yeah. to sort of honor their legacy here within the city of Wilmington and to talk about that connection to sort of early chemistry and early pharmacy industry. Now, when we talk about the kitchen, we know so much about the Bringhurst and the Shipleys, but there was a whole group of people that were behind the scenes, um, taking care of them, taking care of their every need. And do we know a lot about those people? We know a remarkable amount of those, um, about the, the workers of Rockwood, um, starting with the very earliest individuals that came here with Joseph Shipley from England. Um, so starting um, with photography, uh, we have a huge photography collection associated with the house. It's housed and digitized with the University of Delaware Special Collections today. And um, it's over 5,000 photographs, and a lot of those are the people that worked here. So um, individuals that held positions as cooks, as butlers, as stewards, as um, uh, chambermaids, as laundresses. I mean, we have documentation about a lot of them. Also, we also have the how do I say this, the bookkeeping records of the house. Mm -hmm. And so we have like, we know who che who received checks in 1892. We know mm -hmm. who cashed checks in 1930, how much they were spending on groceries, those kinds of things. So we have a fair amount of information about how this house was run behind the scenes. So were a lot of the people that worked here, did they stay for long term or was there a lot of turnover? I mean, were they considered, you know, family to an extent? Um, I think that probably changed from generation to generation within the house. Different family members had different kinds of relationships with the staff here. And it seems like Joseph Shipley had probably the closest and most familial relationship with some of his staff. Um, individuals, were, after he died in 1867, he gave thousands of dollars to some of his servants. Some of those individuals died very wealthy people in their own right um, years later. But um, but like the Brinkhurst were much more formal in their relationship with the, with the, um, with the staff. And we we even have a letter from one of the Brinkhurst matriarchs of the house that is this very step-by-step -step letter of her expectations about what the servants can and cannot do in the house, including like things like eating liver or making noise on the uh, on the upper um, hallway areas. It's really funny. That's amazing. And you think about how big this house is, you know, I know that, the, how did they communicate? I see that there's sort of a box on the back here that has like different rooms is it was it a bell system they, or? Call, they call it a, yeah exactly a bell system um, oftentimes they call it sort of an enunciator system and so when you're walking through the house you can see basically what looked like little doorbells either in the floor or on the walls and at one time you'd be able to press those buttons and the enunciator would alarm and give um, indication like a little arm would jump as to which room a certain mm -hmm. servant was needed and it would sort of help not to not only to tell where the family was located and what they 
they needed, but which of the servants might come. That's amazing. I can imagine how it would be connected by like a like wires or... That was, but the earliest annunciator system that we have here, and we only have remnants of this inside the wall, was actually a pole system wow. where cables that are actually worked into the plaster walls here at the mm -hmm. house, you would pull on one end of the house and it would ring bells in this room. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So when you talk about how beautiful this um, exhibit is, it's not the only one. And of course, we're going into a brand new year. So what have you got planned for us? Oh, for this will be a really interesting year for us. Um, starting in February, we are launching a small photography exhibition called The Gifts of Chief Quiet Thunder. Uh, Chief Quiet Thunder was a Lenape chief of a New Jersey tribe, so a state-recognized tribe of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, before his passing, he had moved back to Delaware where his wife's family lived, and um, he created culturally significant objects that are cherished by his uh by his descendants and the people of the Delaware tribes today. So um, hunting materials, toys, games, um, materials that help to show the sort of cultural life of the Lenape people mm -hmm. pre-settlement, um, pre-colonial period. And so um, the exhibition that we have is a small show of photographs of these objects, and it's been traveling around this region. And mm -hmm. through our relationship with uh, the, um, the Lenape tribe of Delaware, we've been able to secure it here. So that'll open in February. And then this summer, we have a very exciting thing. Um, I think this is probably the first contemporary art installation that's ever happened at Rockwood. Mm -hmm. We got a little grant from the Delaware Division of the Arts, and we've hired two glass artists to create installations of their original glass work inside the house, which will hang here through November. That's really cool. Yeah, and I think, I don't have any, um, they, they're, they're, they're not giving me any clues yet about what they're bringing, but I hear that one of them is making a chandelier. Oh, nice. I know. Nice. <laughs> so when people come in October to check out, you know, the plans for whatever you guys are doing for October, they'll be able to see it. Absolutely. So um, uh, the, the the contemporary art installation will open in July, but we'll keep it up through November and it will coincide with the um, the special sort of ghost tours and sort of installation that we'll do, the sort of oddities tour that we're now creating inside the house. Um, they won't really overlap with one another because we want the artists to have, feel mm -hmm. separate from what we do in terms of uh, that kind of program. Right. But at the same time, there will definitely be overlaps sure. with the two. Sure. And of course, you guys will start your planning for Christmas. Any any ideas, any previews a year out? What oh, next I know, year I can't give be? away my secrets. No secrets, <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much and Merry Christmas to you. To you as well, thank you for coming. We'll be right back. Isn't this place great? No matter what time of year you come for a visit, it's always beautiful and decked out and there's so much to see. If you come for a visit, make sure that you snap a picture and share it with us on Facebook. Now here are a couple of other things you might wanna check out. information on any of the exhibits here at Rockwood, visit rockwood.org. That'll do it for this week's episode of the 302. Make sure you follow us on Facebook for more behind the scenes content you're just not going to get anywhere else. We're going to leave you now with more of the beautiful decorations here at Rockwood. Until next time, come on in guys. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas from the 302.